All right. Are you ready? I am so ready. Let's do this. Dr. Kane, you're one of my favorite guests. I mean, I, I honestly can't remember. This is episode four or five with you. To me, it's not enough. And whatever it is, it's, it's not enough. It should be double digits at the very least. <laughs> I feel like we just have to have like a regular rotating conversation where we get together because magic happens when we oh my God. get on this podcast. I agree. I agree so much. It's all the information that's in your mind is everything I want to know, period. I mean, that's yeah. just, the, that's just the way. It, I mean, when I found you four, it was probably four years ago now, I was like, yeah. I got to talk to you. I got to talk to you. And our, our first conversation was so awesome. I had you back on like a couple months later. And then I, since then yeah. I've had you on numerous times. Like I said, there's just so much information being a naturopathic doctor, um, living like a, just a very healthy natural lifestyle. Like it's, yes. it's everything I'm into. Um, I know a lot of my audience is into, and you are the master of that. So to have you, you back Mike. on. So I just called you a naturopathic doctor. I can call you an author now too. So yes. congratulations. Thank you. October was October 8th. Panic yes. proof comes out, right? Panic proof, October 8th, 2024. How like freaking exciting is that? It's like my magnum opus. It's like the most beautiful, wonderful thing. I'm so grateful to have gotten to write this book and have such a great publishing team behind me. So I got questions on this. Um, yes. How long did it take? How did you know that now's the time to release it? Like, are you yeah. are you kind of scared that more like research is going to come out like next week and you're like, God damn it. I should have included this in the book. Like, how did you know right. now's the time? I get asked this question by a lot of high achieving entrepreneurs where they're, the question is, is it's not perfect. You're putting something out there. What if you don't believe or what you say gets proved, disproven later, you change your mind. Yeah. And I love that process. I love the process of not knowing and asking questions and doing deep exploration. And so if somebody's like, Hey, Dr. Kane, you talk about ashwagandha as a useful herb in male sexual function. But then mm -hmm. we found this study that says that only ashwagandha grown here is useful for male sexual mm -hmm. function. I'd be like, wow, this is amazing continued research. Let's do another edition of the book. So there you go. I love that. And then in terms of how long it took to write it, is this book is like a tome. It's 300 plus pages. The bibliography is 20 pages in and of itself. It's so wow. densely ba backed with research, but I was able to write it in nine months because wow, okay. I've been churning out copy for years. I write a treatment sheet for my patient and I write an explanation like, here's why we're giving you ashwagandha and yeah, here's yeah. where you could read more. And so I've had all of this information flowing around in my practice and in my brain. So it was easy to barf it all out on paper. The <laughs> most complicated part was the editorial process, which I'm so grateful for, but you got to have thick skin to get through edits. <laughs> did you lots have of to, eyes. did you chop a lot? My editor was really good throughout the process. So I would write a chapter and then we would meet and go over and discuss it. And so it wasn't where I wrote 350 pages and then they're like, you have to cut out 30% of it. It was more like bit by bit as we went, yeah. but it could have been longer. And my editor's like, Dr. Nicole, you got to rein this in. It's really <laughs> long. It's like, so, okay. There's so much to say. So now that you've done one book, is there any desire to do another book? Because this book is about anxiety, correct? And then, but you have yeah. so much more information about other topics. Do you have a yeah. desire to do more books or is this kind of like, you need a break? You don't even want to think about writing another book right now. I have another pitch in with a, with a publisher. So oh. hopefully, yeah, this is top secret. So as at, hopefully they'll buy it because I do have another book. That's uh well, that's yeah. amazing. I was not expecting yeah. that answer, but like yeah, I said, you I have love writing. Do you? Yeah, I love it. There you go. Perfect. Yeah. But you can't Almost tell me what it's about. Not yet. I'll tell you off off this podcast. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I almost love writing almost as much as I love talking with you on this podcast. So it's like <laughs> almost. Oh, I really, really, really like writing, but I love talking almost. to you more. I love that. I, you know, what's funny yeah. is I, I go back to, I don't remember. I think it, I want to say it was episode 24. I could be wrong. And we're in the, we're almost, we're getting close to 200 here. 
I want to say it. And like how literally I would just read you like supplements on air and we would go through all the ingredients one by one by one. It's like, what am I eating here? What am I intaking here? Like that was like one of the most fun conversations because it's like what my nutrition and even to to me, myself and my wife, and now we have a child, like this is super important to us. And like to be able to just read off ingredients. So for anybody who has not heard that episode, you got to scroll back a ways. It is 1000% worth it. Yeah. Like, like I said, the information that you have is, is just, it's, it's insane. I love it. And let's talk a little bit about panic proof. Um, cause our last conversation, it was episode 116. I wrote it down was purely based on anxiety. So I yeah. imagine we touched on a lot of what's going to be in this book, but I kind of want to give you the opportunity to talk about this book and just kind of debrief what's, what can people expect in there? If, I could try to distill the goal of the book down into a really short little blurb is that when you, when you read this book, my heart and my hope is that you will learn a couple of things. One is that your symptoms are your body's solutions to problems as opposed to being the problem. So number one is your symptoms are your body's solutions to problems. And number two is that your body is designed to heal itself. And Mm. our job is to support its natural process in doing that. And that's the foundation this whole book is written from is it's breaking down a paradigm that says symptoms are bad. We want to make them go away. And the experts know more about your body, your nervous system, your mind, the experts know more than you do. And so we go to them, we relinquish our power to the authorities say, please fix this anxiety. My body, my mind are rebelling against me, make it go away. And that isn't trauma informed. The research does not substantiate that perspective. And I would argue that that perspective that symptoms are problems and that the job of the the doctor and the authority is to take those problems and, and silence them for you. That is problematic. That's actually perpetuating the cycle of anxiety. And statistically, we see that happening, that anxiety incidence is record high. In mm-hmm. fact, when the pandemic occurred, they were worried about medication, anxiety medication shortages. There's an article in the New York times, like we're going to benzos. Mm. And so The way that we do anxiety is fundamentally flawed. And this book is aiming to call out the flaw, to change the paradigm and to help empower people in not only having symptom relief, but actually to live healthier, happier, more empowered lives. So that's the heart behind the book. That's awesome. And this is why I keep having you back on because this is what I believe in. And I'm I'm thinking, um, I've never seen a doctor for anxiety, but who do people normally go see when it comes to anxiety? And I feel like like kind of what you were just saying is kind of backwards, right? Like we're we're just putting these pills are just basically putting band-aids on things or perhaps like numbing some of the issues instead of getting to the root cause, which is what you're all about. And I absolutely love that. So like what is the normal process for somebody suffering with anxiety these days? Oftentimes people will try to manage it on their own. Uh, when we look at the statistics, so much of it is grossly underreported. One of the biggest myths people have about anxiety is that they don't have anxiety. <laughs> and so I think we have an opportunity to redefine anxiety and then to support people in finding great doctors and helpers to guide them through the process of total healing. And so first of all, where, where are people going is right now I see people, they're coming to me and they've gone to, um, their hairdresser invented. And then their hairdresser is like, maybe you need a counselor, right? So they're going to completely other people just to talk about their frustrations or the typical is they go to their primary care doctor and the primary care doctor will do one of two things, which is the standard of care. If you look this up, the American Medical Association standard of care is uh, antidepressant and maybe therapy, counseling, talk therapy. But that's if they know they're anxious. Sometimes we don't realize our symptoms are anxiety symptoms, autonomic arousal symptoms. And so 
that's the nine types of anxiety, which it, sometimes people, they just have stomach upset all the time. They're annoyed, their stomach's upset, or some people they get heart palpitations, but they haven't made the connection of anxiety. And so they're going to all these different specialists and they're not getting the answers that they need. So I think that the question you're asking gives us the opportunity to look at where people are going and then to help us actually go somewhere that's going to get us the better answers by redefining anxiety. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, do, do you just kind of roll your eyes when all these people are just going to the wrong places? I mean, that has to be like, so frustrating knowing that like, I won't say you have like all the answers, but seeing somebody like you is way more beneficial than somebody going here and here and here and just taking medication, 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 medication. And this kind of drive you insane that so many people are just given the wrong information. It's also kind of publicized. Like you turn on TV, all these like pharmacy commercials and prescriptions and popping pills and all that. So it's, does that just drive you absolutely insane knowing what you know? I think that when I had more Pitta energy, <laughs> <laughs> like is that the fire? Is that the fire? Yes, yeah. All right. So and so Ryan knows Ayurveda, everybody. So that's like very insider language. And we can totally get into that later. But I think I used to feel a lot more frustrated about it. And I feel like where I am now, especially given my story of rock bottom hell in 2015, being the expert perpetuating this problematic pattern as a naturopathic integrative doctor with a counseling degree, perpetuating this problematic pattern is I feel like I have so much empathy and compassion for well-intended doctors who haven't either had the opportunity to look at things from a different perspective or who are afraid of looking at things from a different perspective or because they live in an insurance-based paradigm that makes them liable for going in a different direction as opposed to following the status quo. So in many ways, our doctors are sort of trapped in the, I have to follow the, I have to follow the protocol, even if I want to do more. So I used to get really angry and now I feel compassion and empathy. And I turned that into, well, how can I turn this awareness into how can I have personal power in this situation? And it's having conversations with you mm -hmm. and writing this book and talking as much as I can with anybody who will listen about do A, B, and C, take the medication, go to therapy, put a semicolon at the end of that conversation. And let's look a little bit deeper. Mm, I love that. Yeah. I don't know if it's because I'm so interested in this world that I think that people's eyes are opening a little bit more towards natural pathic solutions. Yeah. Um, I think what irks me quite possibly the most are two things is from what I understand, doctors aren't really necessarily taught like nutrition and how important, uh, nutrition supplements, vitamins are and, and how you feel, um, every day, which just drives me absolutely insane. Um, how can you go to a doctor's and they don't really care about like what the hell you're putting in your body every day and, the, and how you're fueling yourself. Another thing is too, is insurance doesn't really tend to cover going to see someone like you, right? It's to go see the doctors that you were just mentioning that can give them these prescriptions or whatever. And it's like, well, sorry, I want my insurance to cover you. I want to go see you. So it's almost like, it's another loop or it's making it really hard for people to get access to this information, which is also like a huge benefit to this book is because we're actually like, now you're getting access out to the, to the people, which is, which is huge. But that's, I mean, that's, that's kind of an annoyance on my part. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. I 100% agree. And the way the system is set up is that only the, the more financially resourced people were able to get the information that I have. And so when I was just full on private practice, I had a limited amount of time and therefore that limited how many people I could see. And my heart is to serve as many people as possible. And so the question is, is how can I make this accessible to everybody or almost everybody? And so I wrote the book, you can buy the book at any bookstore. And one day they'll be probably on goodwill bookshelves and you can get them for a dollar and <laughs> I have tons of free information. Your the audio book. I'm about the audio. And I saw there's an audio book coming too. Yes. Did you, nar you narrated it, I right? I did. 
yeah, I Amen. I learned that there are words that apparently I have no business trying to pronounce. <laughs> it was really that is fun. awesome. Better you. But than I me. feel I feel your frustration, and so the the question is is what are what is the change that I think that I can impart? And Ryan, you're doing that because you're providing a platform for people. Mm to get that information out and you're sharing it with anybody who finds your free podcast. So Mm -hmm. you're taking agency from this like huge giant problem and you're creating a solution. Yeah. Um, I appreciate that. I'm actually curious going back to the anxiety topic, who doesn't have anxiety? Does anybody not have anxiety? Like for (laughs) real, I I don't know if that person exists and if they do, I want to know who and how. And how do I get some of that? Yeah. Yeah. So let's, let's define anxiety. And so anxiety is autonomic arousal in a context of not feeling empowered or in control. Right. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about what is autonomic arousal. So autonomic arousal is when your body becomes aroused or activated. Everybody's body must become aroused or activated when you wake up in the morning, you get a surge of energy, your body produces cortisol, your melatonin closes down, you get some more serotonin, you wake up, you may get some adrenaline, whatever your alarm goes off or you wake up surprised, right? <laughs> so arousal is normal. Arousal is natural. Arousal is what helps us have great sex. It's what helps us get super excited. It's when, haven't you, you've been, you've skydived, right, Ryan? Uh, a not skydive. I've done, I've done a lot of crazy stuff, but not skydive. Maybe you've seen pictures of you doing things. That oh, hot air balloon. Me. Maybe a hot air balloon. Yeah, that's and probably would, it. Speaking of hot air balloon, I don't want to hijack this. Definitely had major anxiety when I was all the way up there. Yeah. I, I had to sit down in the basket. I had to calm my breath, take deep breaths. And I was like, wow, I am very high up. <laughs> okay. I want to talk. So hold on to that. Don't forget yeah. that air balloon. Yeah. That was really good. Cause I did see pictures where you were like up high and I was like, whoo. So autonomic arousal. And so when your body goes into autonomic arousal, it can make you feel excited. All these things that I was just describing. And if a tiger is chasing you, autonomic arousal will help you escape that tiger. So it will help you have power to be saved, right? So we need it. Is that related to adrenaline? I think people are probably thinking adrenaline. Totally adrenaline. Yes. Epinephrine is adrenaline. Norepinephrine is noradrenaline. And then we have cortisol, stress hormone, and all of the biological changes that occur as a result of these chemicals being released. And so then all of these natural sensations, my heart is pounding, my breathing is faster, my muscles are really tense. Maybe I even feel hot and bothered and restless. All of those feelings when you're in an air balloon, you're walking down the aisle, you're really excited about uh, on a roller coaster, they can feel in context, they can feel completely normal and good and maybe even helpful. But if you're trying to drive down the street in traffic or go to a meeting or do a podcast interview or um do do anything that requires you being calm and present and all of those feelings flood you and you feel out of control or they feel out of context, whether it's a teeny little bit or a whole bunch to where you have to sit on the basket in the air balloon, that's, that's anxiety. So anxiety in context, and that gives you power to run from the tiger is fear. That's normal and good and wonderful. But if it is out of context is something actually dangerous and it's making your world smaller. That's anxiety. Everybody has that to some degree. Yeah. I mean, I was just thinking like, who doesn't have this? And it's like, sounds like anybody that doesn't have to rely on anybody else to kind of like impact their lives, which I don't know if it exists, but then you're on probably like a tropical Island. And then you have to like worry about like hunting and gathering food. So there's anxiety probably in that as well. It's just, I feel like in a world we live today, Mm -hmm relying on other people causes a lot of anxiety. Like you just said, traffic, um, like my projects at work and I'm, you know, my boss. And then you got like relationships with, uh, coworkers, stuff like that. And then yeah. afterward, yeah, it's just, um, yeah. Giving control to like somebody else or just like even like mm-hmm. mother nature or, or whatever it is, that's incredibly difficult. And then I do know people, 
not even just giving control, but the thought of giving control or the thought of they're driving their own narratives um, can drive people absolutely insane. Like making up stories in their heads that just of things that just are not logical, but it seems like logical to them. Um, what do you think about, about that type of anxiety? So let's, let's explore that. This is great. So, all right, we have somebody and let's say that somebody that you're describing in this specific example is telling a lot of stories in their head. They're having anxious thoughts, right? Yep. Okay. So we're going to, we're going to pick up a specific person. So you can talk about somebody, you know, or invent a, a fictional person. So give me an example of an anxious thought that they may have and when that may show up. Um, something, a small medical condition turns into the possibly the worst outcome. Yes. That's just 0.01% chance of actually being yeah. <laughs> happening. Yeah. Yeah. Health yeah, we'll anxiety, that. right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. they, they have anxiety about their health and one of the ways that anxiety is showing up is thoughts, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the conventional model, we'll do a compare and contrast here. The conventional model will say you're anxious. You have anxious thoughts. The thoughts are the problem. Let's figure out how to make the thoughts better. Right. And so mm -hmm. Uh, a conventional physician may say, I'm going to give you an antidepressant that can relieve anxiety and thus controlling some of your thoughts or obsessive compulsive disorder where thoughts really predominate, right? The anxious thoughts, the worried thoughts, the looping intrusive thoughts. If you go to a therapist, the therapist may say, okay, is that thought rational? Is that thought logical? And then your brain may be like, no, it's not. And then your stomach may be like, mm, we don't care. We're going to churn. Your heart's going to flutter. And then your thoughts are going to be like, ooh, we're still anxious. It must actually be real, even mm -hmm. though I've been telling myself it isn't, right? So you have this, this pattern. Is that resonating so far? Yep, yep, yep. Okay. And then we have the understanding of the, the conventional approach to that. And so the better way to do it which is what I teach about in panic proof is we look at those thoughts and we say, okay, thoughts, how are you adaptive? And what do I mean by adaptive? How are these thoughts protecting you, serving you? How are they useful? Because they are, because your mind, your body, your nervous system, your behaviors, your habits, all of the things have come together where at some point having these worried, anxious thoughts has been helpful for you. Mm -hmm. The difference is, is that they are out of context and they feel out of your control. And so now they're taking over, right? Yep. So how are these adaptations? How are these helpful? And then what is that caused by? So what you can do, so someone's listening to this podcast, someone's listening to this conversation, and let's say you deal with health anxiety, you have anxious thoughts. I want you to notice the anxious thoughts. And if you feel something in your body at the same time, much more helpful because it's more data. So, okay, oh, well, I got anxious thoughts. I worry every time I get a an ache or a pain, I just get really, really panicky and nervous and I can't stop thinking about it. Okay, so you notice the body. Okay, I feel that churning in my gut. I'm noticing the obsessive what if thoughts. And then what you're going to do is you are going to follow that down the timeline to the earliest time that you can remember that happening where your thoughts needed to be busy, where your thoughts were racing, where you felt that anxiety in your body. And ideally, you can follow that down a, log a logical thread. Sometimes these, these patterns get stuck in non-logical parts of the body. We can get to that in a moment. But oftentimes, we can follow that down to the earliest moment. And so I did this exercise actually in a, in a conversation yesterday, and the woman was having a lot of chest anxiety. Mm -hmm. And she has tons of ADHD. So her thoughts are all, all over the place. <laughs> so we followed that. And she identified the very first moment that she could remember feeling that way. And she was in second grade and she was struggling with reading. And everybody knew that she was in a lower reading level because they color coordinated the books, depending on your reading level, which I think is just ridiculous. Yeah. Kids were bullying yep. her. 
And she came up with the idea of getting the higher level book color and hiding her book inside of it. And she got this surge of fear. Someone's going to catch me. Mm -hmm. So now we have an adaptive state. I feel scared. I feel out of control. I'm being bullied. My thoughts are all over the place. I come up with this idea, but it's not from a place of woohoo and power. It's with fear. So that adaptive state stayed with her. It's like, here's a metaphor. It's like you go to Alaska in the winter and it's very cold. You adapt by putting on a warm coat. We have to continue to adapt. Otherwise that coat will become a problem for us. So she adapted in that moment when she was little and that adaptation stuck with her where she had lots of chest anxiety, just like she did when she was little, lots of racing thoughts. But that's like, you put that winter coat on and you glue it shut and you never take it off. And then you move to Mexico mm. and you're now suffering because you have this coat on and it's stuck. And so that adaptive state got stuck and then she found herself replaying it. So I want to give you a chance to kind of tell me like how that landed so far. Cause that's a lot. That's no, that's a wonderful metaphor. Yeah. I, I really appreciate that. That makes a lot of sense. It's like, you know, going to therapy and kind of finding the root issue of like where this actually came from. What, what, what do you do with that information though? So you found out why this started with her back in whatever grade you said it was. Um, so then, so then what, what do you, how, what do you do? Yeah. We do a couple of things. And one big thing that your audience is getting to hear that I think is not being discussed enough, but that's the beauty of naturopathic medicine is that we look at all the different systems is this is a little complicated. And I want to use the exercise analogy before I tell you what happens. Cause sure. I think visuals are better. So have you ever used a BOSU ball, which is like a oh, yeah. platform on one side for you to stand on. And then the other side is like a half ball. Yep. Right. Okay. So you stand on a BOSU ball and it's like a little bit wobbly, right? Yep. You got to like find your center and use your core and find your balance. So let's say that I put a 15 pounder in your right hand and a 15 pounder in your left hand. You find your balance, right? Yep. So now I'm going to walk up to you and I'm going to take the 15 pounder out of your right hand and I'm going to give you a 30 pounder. So now one side is heavier than the other, right? Yeah. Yeah. The moment that I hand you that heavier weight, what is going to happen? What are you going to do? you're probably going to lean towards one side and then try to overcorrect with the other. Like, yes. Yeah, exactly. You are going to have to adapt other parts of your body, not mm. just that one thing. Right. Yep. So what happens when we create a part or an adaptation or we put on a coat, other systems in our body are going to complement that. And so what that means is that the gut microbiome in that moment of that little girl, she put on that metaphorical coat. She had the heart palpitations, the brain and the body and the nervous system, the hormones, the immune system, the gut microbiome, they are all going to get on board to support her as a head to toe being to keep her in that protected state. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. And so now she's going through life and we have this adaptation, this this winter coat, this stuck state. And now she's showing up as an adult. And when that pattern gets reactivated because the body keeps the score, right? Bessel van der Kolk's book, the body keeps the score. Now those get reactivated. And so if we don't continually reprogram and re re pattern, we are getting programmed for anxiety without our consent from the, even before we come into this yeah. life, because we yeah. inherit trauma. So what does that mean? So that means that when we're treating that is we can do a three minute hack where we go into that part, we do a mindfulness exercise and we talk to that part. This is something that's used in EMDR and ego state therapy, all sorts of trauma informed therapies. But the part that's often missed is now we just changed the brain state, but what in the gut is feeding those old state loops? So now mm. we got to make sure we get the gut back on track. And then, okay, behavior wise, what thoughts and behaviors am I installing to maintain this new state? And hormone wise, we got to give chance for your hormones to re-equilibrate. Your body's been used to releasing lots of cortisol in these circumstances. So you got to work maybe even using herbs or nutrition. So the, the process is super multi-system, but it doesn't have to be that complicated. Oftentimes it's just about acknowledging, going back 
beginning the intentional reprocessing with the counseling, the therapy, and then working on healing the gut and the brain. Love it. Okay. That's, that was a lot of amazing information. And one of the questions I have (laughs) written here is, is your goal to alleviate or to control these symptoms? The goal is to recalibrate you so that you are in an optimal state of health that is relevant for the present moment. Okay. So the, the title of the book ends with an end anxiety forever because anxiety is autonomic arousal that's occurring out of your control, out of your context. Right. And so if you get in, if, if you, if that girl, she did all that work, she reprogrammed it. And then her body is in a state of balance. She no longer has these inflammatory microbes that are sending fear signals to the brain to keep that cortisol pattern going. She re-equilibrates her body and her mind are so much healthier that she feels fully empowered and equipped to manage whatever comes her way. So she can listen to the signals from the body that says, Ooh, I'm feeling a little rushed right now. I feel like a little bit of tension in my chest. I'm anxious, but I'm noticing a little bit of data from my body, but I know exactly what to do to bring myself back into a centered place of control because I've done it a thousand times and I've programmed that. Awesome. That's so powerful. It's like taking control back. That that is for somebody. I I, I can't say I do. I deal with like panic attacks or something like that. For the for the people I know that do, I know it's crippling. I know it can yeah. just like derail, not just a day, probably way more than a day. And to get back online after that, I mean, that's just that's a huge huge issue. And I, this book is gonna it's gonna blow people away and help help their lives like so much for the greater good. I I, I yeah I. I I really, what's the word I'm thinking of? Feel. I just, I feel for the people that have to deal with with major anxiety. Like I said, how crippling it is. I want to kind of hit on. You said the hot air balloon. You said you'll come back to that because I that's something I can relate to. And that's a fear. I have a fear of heights in specific situations, especially when it comes to like cliffs and ledges. Um, I have all the symptoms of anxiety. Like when when I get. I have, I, I can't even like drive on a road with like, without like a guardrail and you're up on like a mountain and got the switchbacks and stuff like that. Like I start to white knuckle it completely. I will even drive in the middle of the road, even though that it might be oncoming traffic because I can't mm-hmm. get close to the edge. I feel, um, probably like the veins or capillaries or whatever. And my fingers start to get constricted. Um, my hands start to sweat. Um, I have this probably illogical fear of like falling over the ledge or if I'm like hiking, I'm great at hiking. I love hiking. But once I get to the top and everyone gets to the top of the mountain, I can't look over the edge because I have this weird fear that like a gust of wind is just going to blow me off. And then like, I, I don't know, I don't know where this really comes from, but it's, it's legit. It's, I try not to let it ruin my life, especially some of my adventures and stuff like that. But there are moments it just shuts me down. I literally just like, will get like on my knees, have to, start breathing because my, my heart starts racing and stuff like that. And I mean, that's probably me just telling myself story is kind of like what, what we were just talking about. I don't know if you, you have any insight on that, but it's my biggest fear is definitely a fear of heights. When did that begin? Do you remember? I don't necessarily know. However, I do recall as corny as this may or may not be, I remember when I was probably eight years old and I know my dad and actually, you know what? No, I actually can, I might be able to pinpoint this. We were at an amusement park and I remember my dad took me on this ride that went higher than I thought that was spinning, going backwards, just doing all these loops. And I remember I was screaming to get off the ride. I might have even threw up when I, when I got off. And I remember my dad apologizing. Like, I didn't know that's what the ride did. He just wanted to go take a nice ride with me. And it was an, it was an amusement park. And it was, I remember just wanting to get off. And then I remember at some point afterwards, we went to like Disney world and my dad and sister did like splash mountain. And I saw how high the drop was. And I remember like, no, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. I'm going to stay with mom and not go on this. I, I really remember those two moments from being really young, from being like panicky and scared, like the amusement park rides. Ryan, of course you have a fear of heights. It makes so much <laughs> sense. 
what a traumatic, scary, difficult thing for a little guy to go through. Yeah. And I was a dad, like as yeah. a dad to a son myself, like I'm like kind of like aware of that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So, so your part, so when we're going through something terrifying like that, you right? can't get off. That's the, that was kind of, yeah, you can't yes. get off. Yeah. You were out of control. You had no power. You had no agency. You had no freedom. Yeah. You were just terrified. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's like starting a car engine and Bessel van der Kolk teaches about this in his book too. So it's like starting a car engine. So you're revving up the engine, you're releasing adrenaline, you're releasing cortisol, all of those fear hormones. And you can't save yourself. Mm -hmm. Your body's like, we got to run away from the tiger. We're in danger. We're going to die. And they, and it can't free you. You are trapped. And so what the body will do is it will do, it's called somatic reenactment is it's going to keep trying to resolve that issue. And so that issue, that experience is not only stuck in your memory Mm. where you can logically access it, but your whole body got affected, right? You felt oh, yeah. tense, you threw up, it was in your gut, <laughs> it was in your chest, it was everywhere. And so then the brain, when it gets really panicky and frightened like that, the amygdala is like, ah, yeah. terror. And then it logs away memories in the hippocampus and the other memory storage and processing centers of the brain. But the especially big challenge with that is, is when we're in terror, our logical brain's aren't going to work correctly. Mm. And so we get thoughts and feelings that aren't really cohesive sentences. We may get flashes or sensations. And so even though your logical brain knows now that that highway road with a guardrail, that it's not that really high, scary roller coaster ride that you were on, you know, you're not going to jerk the wheel and drive off. You know that, but the body doesn't know that. I feel like I am. I know. Yeah, you're right. I feel like I'm going to jerk the wheel and go off. Obviously, like, yeah, you're right. Like, I am I know I'm not going to do that, but there's a part of me yeah. that just feels like it could happen. Yeah. So that you've been programmed and your anxiety is here trying to help you. It's like, look, this program is here. I got you. And thing that reminds us of that, we're going to make you terrified because that's going to try to get you away. So you're somatically reenacting. So part of it is what I was trying to discern in the beginning is, Maybe you should be anxious on cliff edges. It prevents you from being reckless, but yeah, there's a component to it that is an adversity that got stored in your nervous system and your body, but you can reprogram that. We see in all of the research neuroplasticity that you can reprogram that. And so the goal would be for you to be able to go and do adventurous things, maybe get a little bit nervous, but be like, that's interesting. I need to work a little bit more with my nervous system, but not to feel out of control and to not feel terror. So I need that. I'm going to give you a four-step process for that. Okay. That's going to be how we bring home this episode. Is that would be amazing because I have a follow-up question to this, but yeah, please, please give me that process. (laughs) So I want to give you and your audience a 90-day challenge because I know 90 days. We can do anything for 90 days, right? Oh, yeah. And oh, yeah. that's because it, the neuroscience shows that it takes 90 to 120 days to create a new habit. Plasticity okay. change doesn't happen overnight. So 90 days, every day, four things. Number one is I want you to practice getting into the body, calming the body, grounding the body. And so this is anything of your senses. So go outside. You live where there's beautiful weather right now. I want you to go outside and I want you to close your eyes and I want you to listen for three things you can hear. I want you to breathe and see if you can smell three things. And then I want you to touch three things. Maybe the grass under your bare feet, maybe your little one's hand, maybe Mm. the fabric of your shirt. Maybe you have a fidget, whatever it is. I want you to get in your body. I want you to just be present. When you start getting a little aroused, I want you to use cold. I want you to put cold on your body. Practice grounding into the body because when we get aroused, The logical brain is not resourced. It's it's anxious, right? You don't want to analyze why the tiger is running from you. You just want to get away. So we Mm got to focus on the body. Number one. So you're going to do that two minutes every day. Go outside, practice being mindfully aware, practice using the skills to get you back into your body that make you feel really grounded because then when stress happens, you will have practiced that 90 times, right? Mm. Okay. Number two, 
is now we're going to work with logical brain. So we just did that. So we identified a trigger. We identified a memory. You went back. You're like, oh, I see. I know when this came from, right? So now you're going to start to mindfully reprogram that. You're going to go, I want you to do the, go to my website and look up three minute hack. And you're going to practice that two, three minutes every single day. So three minute hack. And I can get you the direct link for your audience. Would and love so- that. We had more time. I would walk you through the three minute hack, but it's, it's a, a, an abbreviated how to be your own therapist and start clearing out stored traumas from awesome. the brain and the nervous awesome. system. That's so huge. you're going to do that for, so you just grounded for two minutes. Your logical brain is like, huh, I'm back. Now you're going to do the three minute hack. You're going to clear those old triggers that you identify. And the third step is now we got to bridge the gap between the mind and the body. Because when you're driving down that interstate or you're in that mountain curve, you logically know I'm in control. I am fine. But the body is like, nope, we don't hear that message. We're, we're, we're going to just make you feel stressed, white knuckling. Yep. So you're going to start the process of bilateral communication from the body to the brain and the brain to the body. And so that is all about interoceptive awareness. So maybe while you're doing the outside grounding, you can combine these things. But when you feel the ground under your feet, notice what you feel in your feet. Then scan up and notice what do you feel in your legs? Hmm, I feel a little bit of tightness there. Interesting. Scan up. Notice what you feel in your pelvis. Oh, my lower back is hurting. It's kind of inching. Okay, just notice it. Mm-hmm. Work your way up your body and you practice allowing your brain to be more aware of what the body is doing. So somatic practices, mindfulness practices, yoga practices. These are things to do because you're starting to increase interoceptive awareness because if you can identify anxious triggers when they're whispers, because you've become so familiar with your body, you won't have to wait for them to be screaming. Oh, that's awesome. Panic, right? So the, the fourth step is the most important step. And you're really good at this. A lot of people want to skip this. Is people ask me, how can I just be calm? Dr. Kane, what do I do? I want to stay in my window of tolerance. I don't want to be anxious. You have to practice arousal, starting that car engine. Like what happened to you on that roller coaster? Your body went into arousal, but you never got to complete the loop. You have to complete the loop or the body's just going to keep doing it again and again and again. Hmm. So you're going to practice going into arousal and then bringing yourself out. So if you have a high ropes course, this would probably be good for you. Mm. is to go up the high ropes course, breathe, do steps one through three, breathe, and then get off the course after two minutes, whatever's in your window of tolerance. And then you're going to go back and you're going to do it for a little bit longer. And every time you do it, you're going to teach your nervous system that we can feel really big feelings. And I can save us Mm. and come back out. Right. So you have to do that, reprogram it. And it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger every time. And so now you have a foundation for doing the further work of clearing that specific trauma Hmm. or anything. That's amazing. I mean, just within five minutes, like I can't imagine how much different my life would be if I didn't, like I said, crippling was the word that I used before. It's definitely at times crippling. Like we were just talking uh, before we started to record um, when we were in Arizona recently, like a month ago, and uh, we got a recommendation, go to Jerome, Arizona. And I was like, oh, that sounds awesome. And I read that it's not for the faint of heart, the drive up there. So I was like, I ended up not going because I was scared to do the switchbacks on the road. Like all the stuff I feel like I'm missing out, it would be so wonderful to alleviate this, which I mentioned a follow-up question. I want to get to, I know that guy should five more minutes. Yeah. Um, can can this fear or is this fear going to be passed down to my child? And I, and I ask, is it genetic? Is it environment? Is it like him seeing me be scared? Cause my mom's afraid of heights. So did I get it from her? Did I get it from this experience? Is it a mix? Like where, where does this come from? And I really want to want to be aware. Like if I am scared, if I am nervous, like not passing it down to him, like, stepping out of the room or stepping away. So he doesn't see it. Like how much of an impact does that have? I have two things. One is that he's going to feel fear because he's human. And 
So the question is, is what do we do with fear? And you have the opportunity to teach him to embrace fear, to notice fear, to be in fear. You feel afraid right now and you're safe, but you're having some big feelings. So let's just notice them and they will pass. And it's okay to feel that. So he's watching you and he's watching to see what do we do when we're angry? What do we do when we're sad? What do we do when we're frightened? Mm -hmm. And so he's watching you with that. And the goal is to not ever experience fear because fear is a very valid, beautiful, wonderful feeling. It's part of what makes us human. But you want to instill in him that I can still be safe and in control, even when I feel big feelings mm -hmm. and then how to regulate them. So that's the first thing is he's going to be afraid. And that's a wonderful gift. Number two is where did this come from? Because for me, it can be crippling. It can be really devastating. When I had my worst anxiety, I lost so much weight. I stopped having my period and I was like totally debilitated. Mm -hmm. That's not something that's like wonderful and beautiful. And like, yeah, I just noticed that. Right. That for me came from a multi-system adaptation to really awful upbringing. And so those who are listening and they're like, well, where did my anxiety come from? Is, is do I, I teach about this in the book. I, there, the whole exercise is called the weathered house. And in short, kind of like a TLDR of that is that everything that did or did not happen to us is impacting how we are feeling today. And so for you, Ryan, for sure, my bet, I would be willing to eat a cactus if this didn't happen. I bet if you cleared that trauma, if you cleared that memory, you would be 90% better, if not totally. You would be mm. like so much better because you have a very specific big T trauma, a big, yep. scary, powerless event that happened. Yeah. Some people it could be, and I've worked with lots of people that they went to an elementary school with mold. And that's created total immune system inflammation that causes brain dysfunction, anxiety. Some people, they, um, they don't get the nutritional needs met. Their parents are feeding them Kool-Aid and garbage. And so then we have changes in the gut and that can cause anxiety. Some people go through socioeconomic instability and that's really anxiety provoking. So the question you asked is yes. And yeah. And it's all about your individual circumstances. And so, and I know it's like such a big topic mm -hmm. that's now in a 300 page plus book, but I promise you that by the end of finishing this book, you will have a panic proof protocol. So you know exactly what to do, what strategies to use, what to take. I help you make herbal tinctures. I help you pick out supplements. I help you pick out habits and you'll learn the nine types of anxiety. So you know what testing to get, if any. And you will walk away with the end of this book with a plan of this is what I do to heal my anxiety forever. I mean, what else, what else can you ask for? Like, like I said, like just my fear of heights, <laughs> if I alleviate just my fear of heights, my life would be completely different. So I can't imagine the people that walk yeah. around with all these different anxieties that just get to them. I only, I only deal with that on occasion when I'm traveling or I'm doing an yeah. adventure. Like I can't imagine having the anxieties that people deal with like every single day. So that's, yeah. Yeah, I'm really excited for people to get their hands on this and for you to start changing many, many people's lives just for the better and and like really changing it, finding the root cause of this and really helping people fix their lives. Because like you said, like anxiety is just getting worse and worse yeah. and worse. Yeah. And I'm thinking social media plays such a huge role in that. Well, everyone's scrolling on their phones all the time. And then we have the election coming up. Oh my God. We <laughs> Turn on yes. the news. Turn on the yes. news. And it's like, oh. Uh, anxiety overload. We yeah. need, we need this book. It's like food for the soul. <laughs> yeah. I want to come back if you'll have me. And I want to, I want to do the three minute hack with you. Cause I left you with like a big, Oh, do this. And so I think it would be really, if you're comfortable doing this with your let's audience and me yeah. is let's do the three minute hack and we can walk you through exactly how to go in and clear that memory. Of course, if you're your insurance would probably cover EMDR, probably be like three to five sessions and you're good to go. But some people, they don't have good EMDR practitioners or they don't have good insurance coverage or they can't afford the deductible. So we could go through exactly how to do this exercise yes, together I'm in. in the podcast. So I'm in, I would absolutely awesome. love that. Yeah. And it's, I think it'd be good insight for people, people to listen to and people to hear that deal with yeah. anything similar to what I'm dealing with. That would, yeah. That would be absolutely amazing. Oh, I I gotta let you go. I 
hate that. I can keep you all day, but, but give us the lowdown. Where can we follow you? Where can we find you? Tell us uh, where can we get your book and October 8th, correct? October 8th, anywhere books are sold. I like shopping local, but if you do have a hanker and to buy it on Amazon and you leave me a lovely review, that helps the publisher know that they should buy my next book. So that would be cool. And I'm on Instagram. I love hanging out with you on Instagram. It's Dr. Nicole Kane. The book is called Panic Proof. And I am so excited to come back and hang out with you, Ryan. This is been yes. oh, as always. I adore as you. always as the Thank time you. just flew. I didn't even realize what time it yeah. was. I was. Like, oh, I gotta let uh, you go. Uh, I hate it. I yeah. absolutely hate that. But I have to let Two. you go. Until next yeah. time, I'm so happy you'll be back. Whenever you want to come back, come on back. We'll dive a little deeper. All right. That sounds wonderful. Thank you, my dear. Take awesome. care. Awesome. Talk soon. <laughs> Bye.